All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What a joy it is and a privilege to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and say unto you, it is good to be on the Lord's side. We thank God for what he is doing in our midst, and we thank him for all of the great things that he continues to do for each of us. And truly, God is worthy to be praised. So we want to, at this point, get ourselves um, acclimated to what we are going to do this afternoon for our Bible study moments. We are certainly grateful to him. I have trying to get this get in the camera so you can see me, and uh, I don't know whether I'm in it or not. But we thank God. Okay, I think I'm. I think I'm in it now. Amen. We want to get ourselves going. Uh, somebody will say, Pastor, that's a lot to have to go through to get yourself ready for study. And uh, you are right, but it has to be gone through because you got to be able to see it. Amen? Amen. Now, we want to uh, get ourselves together. I don't see any comments, but I want to see the comments. Amen. All right, I see you. Okay. Carol O'Neill is on. Brother Muhammad is on. Nicholas Reynolds is on. Okay. All right. We are grateful to God for our um, Wednesday morning Bible study. We're grateful for what he is doing in our midst. I have uh, dealing with sinuses and allergies and oh my goodness, it's just something, it's just something, it's just something, it's something, it's something, but I'm grateful to God for how he is blessing me even right now. I want you to uh, know that I welcome you to our hashtag purity uh, virtual Bible study and it's a joy it is uh, to really be before you and to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Uh, I want to say to all of you who have been so faithful to our study, thank you for being on. Thank you for being a part uh, of what's going on. I see LaCasha. Amen. Thank you for being on. <coughs> Eric Tovine. Amen. So we yeah. Deaconess Reynolds, that's good. I'm glad. Well, I'm not glad, but it's, I understand that we are all going through this same thing together. It's better when you know that it's not just you, so I appreciate that, but I'm not glad that you're going through it. Um, I want to say welcome. I want to thank you for all you have done. I especially need to say thank you to those of you who were kind to me and my associate ministers during the um, Pastor and Clergy Appreciation Month. I appreciated that uh, so much. It, it meant a lot uh, to have your kindness and your um, your help uh, during that time, you uh, made a difference that you don't even know that you made just by uh, being there and just by sharing uh, in that direction and in that way uh, with persons who were a part of our church and a part of our ministry. You made, you made, you made a difference. So we appreciate you uh, for that. At this time, uh, I think about all the cards, the beautiful gift I can't even put it on camera at this point, but uh, beautiful gifts that were given and all those things. And uh, then later, some uh, food items that came and had some stew. The stew came just in time. Uh, Sister O'Neill, you can tell Brother Ray, the stew came just in time. I needed that soup. I needed that soup. It's been helpful uh, for this day. Um, 
Yeah, I have done that, uh, Brother Muhammad, but it, um, the cayenne pepper initially um, makes me sneeze, so I didn't want to do it now. I'll do it after, but you're, I do add that to my um, tea, and I appreciate that advice. I appreciate that. I appreciate your concern. Um, turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We've been sort of going um, in some kind of sequential order in this series, the portrayal of uh, the Christ uh, as portrayed in the Gospel of John. And so we're going to continue in that way. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And if you're on and, and you'd like us to know you're on, just put a message in the in the chat and we'll, we'll know you're here. We appreciate you uh, being with us on whatever means you are. Uh, sharing with us. We're going to uh, start with verse uh, 35 and, and we'll skip around and read a little as we And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye have also seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I am come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he hath come down from heaven? How does he say that? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save, save he which is of God. He has seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat meat and manna, in, did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which come down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. The bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us this flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth and drinketh my flesh, eateth and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, I live by the Father, so that he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which come down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, but they eateth bread that shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? <coughs> when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Is it the spirit that quickeneth? The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, that are, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore saith I unto you, that no man could come unto me, except it were given him by the Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked walk no more. Then Jesus saith unto the twelve, Will ye go also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, saying, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He 
he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that would betray him, being one of the twelve. Amen. All right. Reverend Montague, Deacon Grayson, uh, Deacon S. Costin. Amen. We're so glad to have all of you on. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Most holy, all wise, eternal God, our Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be in your presence. Kind Father, we need to hear from you. We need a word from you. If we don't hear from you, what will we do? Discretion is now with you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like for you to think with me for a little while on the subject uh, for, of our lesson, the audience response to the preacher. The audience response to the preacher. We have all heard messages, sermons, Bible studies, whatever it might be. And no matter what it is, we have some sort of response. Pre preaching plays an important role in the life of the church. In fact, the scripture declares that we are saved by the foolishness of preaching. Congregations demand helpful sermons. They, are, they also expect preparation, effective delivery, and decisions from the sermon. In return, the preacher expects a listening and responsive audience. The hearing of an audience plays an important part in the sermon. Jesus told a parable about how people listened to and received the gospel message. He told of the sower who was sowing seed. Some seed fell by the wayside. Some seed fell among thorns. And some seed fell on rocky soil. And still some more fell on good ground. From this parable, we could say that every sermon has a response. Every Every Bible study, every uh, scripture reading, all of that has some response. Jesus was a masterful preacher. When he preached, people responded. Let us notice the different responses to his sermon. God bless you, Deacon Watson. We're glad to have you. There are at least three different responses that we're going to note in the text for the morning. First, the religious leaders and their response, which was rejection. So one of the responses that any group can have to any sermon or any message that is given to them, whether good, bad, or indifferent, is rejection. The Jews resented the, the Lord's message. The scripture says in verses 35 and 41, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus had referred to the experiences of the Israelites when God fed them manna. God gave them life, for life was in the bread. Jesus then applied the bread to himself. And so he, he went further into that. Uh, they murmured about it. They questioned it because they thought to themselves, how can he give this kind of message? But, but even when he was talking about, you must eat of me, you must drink of my blood, he spoke of that in a figurative way, suggesting that we create that kind of connection and that kind of work, which makes communion, the act of participating in the Lord's Supper, so important. Now, I have always talked about this, and this is something that we don't, we run too closely, and we don't think through it, true about it. The difference between a sacramental system and an and, and, and ordinance. So when we think communion is a sacrament, that means that somehow um, we feel that Christ has turned what the elements before us from a use that was physical to actually his body and his blood. Now we don't, in, in the Baptist church, we don't believe in a sacramental system, but there are um, churches that believe in that. The system that we believe in is ordinance. That is, it is the order of Christ, and what is before us, the bread and the fruit of the vine, are symbols. They are symbols. So we're not eat, eating his actual flesh and his actual body, but we are symbolically partaking of him in a way that says we are fully connected and ready to serve him in spirit and in truth. But the religious leaders of that day rejected that message. They didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to be involved with that. 
the Jews also rejected the messenger. To resent the message is to reject the messenger. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he said, I am come down from heaven? In, in, in verse 42, The Jews regarded Jesus only as the son of Mary and Joseph. They judged the Lord by external standards. And often in our time that we are living in, there are many who, uh, like these Jews, see the external things, see the lineage, see who we are and what they know about us, and they use that to judge us rather than what God has done in and through us. And what, what happens is when persons reject, they get so caught up in the, uh, in the external standards and in the, in the packaging of the message that they forget that God uses all and any to do his will. Now, this was Jesus, so we don't have to make that kind of excuse. But in, 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 in the case of ourselves, God uses any and all. He can use any and all to deliver his message. He used uh, a donkey. Uh, there's another word for donkey. I don't want to say it on the... But, but he, if he can use a, a, a donkey, <laughs> then, then I know to deliver his message, then I know that he can use me or you or any of us to get his message across. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in external standards. Isn't that this one's son? Isn't that that one's son? Is it, didn't they come from this place? I knew them when. I know them this way. I, when I remember them, this was what's was going on. And sometimes we get so wrapped up in that that it causes us to reject a message that is truly uh, one that would help us and make us better if we would listen to it uh, more carefully. God's greatest message and messenger came through a Galile Galilean carpenter. The Jews denounced both his message and him. Within every audience, there will be those who will resent God's message and reject his son. And you know, that's something that we have to prepare ourselves for. Not everybody's going to receive you. Not everybody's going to understand you. Not everybody's going to clap and applaud. Not everybody's going to accept your message. But the scripture gives you indication with that too. He said, you shall shake the dust off your feet as a testimony for others to not even go in that direction. So it's important for us to realize that there will be, to, to some messages, there will be rejection. There are some simple things that have nothing to do with God's message that we tell people that they just don't listen to. They look at who's saying it. They look at the message, whether or not they like what was said. Even this message, this advice that Brother uh, Muhammad gave me on Bible study related to uh, using cayenne pepper in my tea. I could have accepted that message in many ways. I could have determined I'm not uh, using any cayenne pepper. I don't want to hear that. I could have said, well, is he a medical doctor or something like that? You know, so there are all these kinds of things that we, we use. But I understood I was accepting of the message. I understood it. I understood where it was coming from, the intent of it. And the truth of the matter is I've done it before. So I know that it will be helpful. I just know the reaction that I may have to it initially. So, so it's important that we understand that every message we give will have some type of reaction and we have to be prepared enough and strong enough to give the message regardless to what the reaction is and to expect that there are some messages that we will give, that we will share, that will in some way be rejected by those who we give it to. And we may give it with the truest intentions, the purest of heart, and yet we still find ourselves in the midst of having our message rejected. The next uh, um, type of way that somebody can receive a message, we're going to look at the crowds. We looked at the, the, uh, the Jews or the, the religious leaders. Now let's look at the crowds. The crowds became dropouts. So now this is no longer rejection. This is a dropout. And a dropout is different than someone who rejects it. Someone who rejects it says, looks at it, listens to it, examines it and says, no, I don't want to do it. A dropout li looks at it, listens to it, and, and just walks away. Jesus was popular with the crowd. <coughs> Jesus was popular with the crowd at the beginning of his ministry. People were attracted to Jesus. They heard his unusual sermons, watched him perform miracles, 
they enjoyed the benefits of his multiplying the loaves and the fish. The crowds, however, could always change their tune. And that's one of the reasons why I don't build my um, my esteem or who I am based on the tone or the tonation of a crowd. Because a crowd will change just as quick as somebody in the crowd gives out a new chant. A crowd can go either way based on whatever the crowd may be feeling in the moment. And there are times when in the moment a crowd may feel something one at one second and then in the next moment they feel something else. And so you can never uh, base your full feeling or your full uh, esteem or anything that relates to you on the work of the crowd. Now there will be those in the crowd who you can look to or, or who you know have a true intention and a true heart uh, and they, you know you all have that connection, that love uh, for one another and so you know they will never do anything to mislead you or misguide you. But crowds in the, in the sense of, in the generic sense, in the general sense, you cannot build your thought on that. Because they will love you in one minute and say crucify you in the next. And sometimes in the very same minute, that love trickles out into hatred. So you got to be careful with that. Some of us want to be popular. We want views. We want likes. We're doing things on Facebook, Instagram, all kinds of things. TikTok, 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 uh, uh, Snapchat, all of these things to, to get some kind of popularity. And yet, even with the popularity, even with the message being out, we find ourselves in a place where a crowd hasn't helped us because you've got millions of viewers but when you get sick can you get some chicken noodle soup when you have something on your heart that you need to talk about who can you call the crowds began to depart from Jesus from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him John chapter 6 verse 66 John 6 6 6 uh, in that interesting verse number for what it refers to. Why did these people leave? They left because they found the way of Jesus to be too difficult. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Verse 60. They didn't mean that it was hard to understand. Rather, it was hard to accept and put into practice. The crowds knew the claims of Christ, and they were not willing to accept and follow him. When they heard what Jesus said, they heard all this, they thought to themselves, not that they couldn't understand it, but this is something difficult. I'm not going to be able to do this. And, and listen, when we hear messages, when we hear the word, sometimes we find ourselves in a place where if we are not dedicated, if we are not committed to our faith, if our faith is not strong, we think to ourselves, this is just something that I cannot do. We're living in a society now where we are, where we, it is suggested that we, rather than push ourselves, that we just admit that we cannot do it. But when it comes to your faith, you've got to understand that it is in the place that you learn that you cannot do, that he really takes your cannot do and does everything through you that you said you could not do. See, it's a difference between uh, what you cannot do in, your, in the natural realm or in your physical self as opposed to what you cannot do or cannot perform or cannot achieve, what you think you cannot perform, achieve, or do in the, physical, in, the, in the spiritual realm. Because in the spiritual realm, his grace is made perfect in your weakness. So what you cannot do in the spiritual realm, you just open up the door for him to magnify his light through you. And now you're going to shine greater because you know you can't do it. So it's only Christ that's working through you and giving you the strength to do it. But these persons did not have that. This, these persons did not have that. Amen. Thank you. That's right, Deacon Grayson. Not people pleasers. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Lakasha. All right, all right, all right. Amen. Now, let us look at this. People have not changed. They continue to respond to Jesus by dropping out. Of course, this does not destroy the idea of the security of the believer. 
It just discloses the reality or pretense of a person's faith. See, this dropping out, see, sometimes we, we, when we hear this, we say, oh, my goodness. Well, is, is, the, is eternal security, is, is once saved, always saved? Where, where, where is that doctrine? Where does that leave if they drop out? The, the, the doctrine is not challenged. This is, see, we are looking at the wrong thing. We want to challenge the wrong thing. The doctrine is not challenged. What's challenged is whether the person's faith was real or pretentious to start with. <coughs> because because when our faith is real and genuine, we will continue to move forward even when things around us cause us to be discouraged and don't want to go. <clears throat> when our faith is true, we understand that it is in my weakness that he's going to be made strong anyway, so I may not know what I'm going to do or how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it anyhow. So some of this really reveals where our faith lies. Now I'm not saying that every struggle that you have, every thought that you have now means that you don't have any faith. No, because there's some natural struggles that you're going to run up on, some things that you're going to run up on. But in the end, when you have that conversation with yourself and you tell yourself, I've got to go on anyhow, that's the result of that difference. And that lets you know that your faith is real. The conversation with yourself, the struggle is not the problem. The, the, the choice that you make as a result of the struggle is what reveals who you truly are. And I don't know about you, but I want to reveal myself as a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. That's who I want to be seen as. Amen. How strong is your foundation? That's right, Brother Muhammad. Now, the next um, choice, I, I, as I look up, you know, I have this, what I call a wall of fame in my office and the pictures of all kinds of people. And as I, I look up, when I looked up just that quick, I saw Deacon is Blue uh, looking down at me telling me to keep on teaching. All right, I'm going to do that. All right. The Apostles. Uh, their response was dedication. The apostles, dedication. Jesus posed an important question to the disciples to test their dedication. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? John chapter 6 verse 67. The disciples had only two alternatives. They could go away or they could stay. This is, this is, I mean, just a simple thing. It's a simple thing. Are you going to go away or are you going to stay? You'll be like the crowd say they do and then they don't. Say they will and then they won't. Y'all don't know that song. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Uh, uh, Jesus posed this question to the disciples. Will you go away? Are you going to leave me? See, he, see, we, 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 we understand these 12 and these 12 are who stayed. But he had many more that followed him. That walked away. Because they, they dropped out. So now, what do these disciples do? Their response is dedication. Disciples are always put to the test. The passing of time in various life situations will disclose the reality of commitment. The passing of time in various life situations will disclose the reality of commitment. If you truly want to know whether someone is committed, you don't have to. You, you'll see it over time. Situations will reveal that. <coughs> Peter answered the master with a demonstration of dedication. Here we go with Peter. You know, now Peter is an interesting fellow. Because Peter had, you know, we, I could spend a whole another 30 minutes on Peter. Peter had ways that, that makes him and I uh, very you know, close. I, I feel connected to him, uh, but 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 he had some some. He, he he was he was he was he. You were gonna know what was on his heart. You were gonna know what was on his mind. Here comes Peter. Peter answered the master with a demonstration of dedication. He said, "Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life." John chapter six verse sixty eight. Peter affirmed that there was no one else to whom the disciples could turn for life. Only Jesus could satisfy their deepest longings. Listen, 
I don't care what you try to do. Weed, liquor, sex, chocolate, whatever it may be, food, uh, job, career, achievement, whatever it may be. The only one that can truly satisfy your deepest longings is Christ. <clears throat> Your deepest desires can only be satisfied by Christ. The hole that you're trying to smoke away, and I'm not necessarily saying that, that we, I, I, you have never heard me say, uh, make any comment about whether I think it's a sin or not. You've never heard me make any comment about that. Uh, but and, and even with liquor, uh, the, 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 the Bible says that you ought to, uh, that you ought to do it in moderation. Uh, in terms of wine and drinking, so, uh, but we know that if you're going, to, if it's going to cause you to stay out of yourself, the scripture says to be sober. You know, be sober. So, so all these things that we're trying to 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 fill our longings with, the more we try to fill it, the more we have to take. The more we try to fill it, the more we have to take. The truth of the matter is that's the same with Jesus. The thing is, though, with Jesus, when he feels your longing, he ought to, see, see, he told the woman at the well last week, I'll be a well of water that continues to spring up in you. Every time you get dry, every time you, you need a new drink, a new feeling, I'll spring up in you. The apostles were dedicated. They were they were dedicated. They were dedicated. They were dedicated. The sermon or the lesson is almost over. You will make a response to this message. Either you will say it was good or it was bad. But this is not your only response. Jesus has been presented. Various responses to Jesus have been cited. You can reject him. You can drop out. Or you can dedicate your life to him. My question to you today is, what will your response be? A response to the message that has been shared, a response to the gospel message, and the response to the fact that he suffered, bled, and died, Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died for your sins, that he got up early on Sunday morning to give you eternal life. What response will you have to that message? Will you reject it? Will you drop out or will you dedicate your life to this service? My brothers and my sisters, let us choose to dedicate our lives to him and allow our faith to take us places that nothing else will be able to take us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have had to be in your presence. And God, we pray now that you would strengthen us and guide us as we go through this time, as we share in this time. We ask you would be with us, that you would allow us to move forward from this Bible study with thoughts in our mind that challenge us to be better as we go forward. Help us to tell somebody else. Help us to share the gospel with somebody else so that we will not sleep in the harvest season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Amen. Chance and a choice. That's right. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing with us. And may God continue to bless you as you continue to serve and do his will. God be with you. Deaconess Reynolds and others who are dealing with this allergy and sadness stuff, we let us pray one for another that we will soon be relieved. God bless you.